Hi, I'm Alisa Moldovan, I'm the University of Kansas School of Public Affairs and Administration, and I have a question to Bradley. Uh, one of your findings uh, talks about increasing cooperation between Shanghai Economic uh, Union and Eurasian Union. And it sounds quite fascinating, and I was wondering to what extent this cooperation as opposed to competition is being shaped by the presence of exogenous factors such as the World Trade Organization or European Union, and what is the relationship between uh, these two Asian organizations and European economic cooperation? It's an excellent question. And I think that what we are seeing fundamentally, especially, is the driving for the, uh, the initial development of uh, the Eurasian Economic Community, et cetera, was obviously heavily driven uh, from Russia's perspective with regard to the question of WTO entry and long-term frustrations along those lines. Um, broadly, though, um, I think that in global factors, WTO still obviously have, have a causal place, have a causal role here, and we do have to take them take them into account uh, as we look at the future um, for this attempt at the SCO and the Eurasian community to actually work together to some degree. Um, that being said, it is remarkably early days. I think uh, we're, what we see in the last four or five months where we have seen this really large shift in the narrative on economic integration from the Kremlin um, and really just beginning to see initiatives such as um, SCO business groups and Eurasian uh, economic community business groups actually having joint meetings, actually having more expanded uh, interaction, um, is something that we're going to have to basically be looking for the looking for the signposts on in the coming in the coming months. Um, it's probably still too early to say. Um, we just need more data and more time um, as regards how this is going to interact with um, other other exogenous causal factors. Hi, I'm Ray Finch uh, from the former Council Executive Office, and I also had a question for Bradley. Um, Joseph Nye wrote, wrote recently in an article titled Bricks Without Mortar, and he talked about uh, how the political differences of the BRIC countries would prevent sort of the, a final coalescence to make this thing really work. And I wonder in this SCO or uh, the various organizations you described, are they all on the same sheet of music with regard to political systems, and will this be then a solidifying factor? I think if we look at uh, what well, we've had uh, arguments on, on commonalities of domestic political structures in the various organizations that have reached multiple different conclusions. Um, there's an excellent article uh, from uh, about one or two years ago uh, which looked at uh, the fact that say all of these are essentially weak institutional. Um, the political structures, the interior political structures, are not solidly institutionalized. What we see is essentially large, simple sets of patron-client relationships. And that, by its definition, will ultimately undermine um, the long-term development of regional economic organizations. Um, and that's possible. And that's where, where, and where we do see that having an impact is where we see private interests, um, particularly among elites, um, resulting in threats to uh, the agenda uh, that would actually support a national interest. Conversely, um, I, I would say that with the BRICS, a massive, uh, massive difference. I don't think uh, that we can necessarily put uh, the Eurasian states in the same category. Um, we are, at least the, uh, the countries that we've discussed today, um, we're not seeing the sort of processes of democratization, obviously, in those states. We're still seeing, obviously, strong, centrally driven, authoritarian, bureaucratic, authoritarian leadership. Um, and to some degree, if we look at the events, I think, of the past year or so globally, um, and that we see much more of uh, pushing together, um, uh, or at least uh, push factors for uh, expanded cooperation, uh, at least economically, um, based on perceived differences um, between governmental style in Russia, China, Central Asia versus the West. Um, I think that that differentiation is likely to become more and more and more salient. I think we saw elements of it in the events in Syria. Um, but on economic factors, I think it's, it's likely to continue to be relevant, actually, to push for uh, future success. Uh, Jim Washington. I'm the doctoral candidate in the Security Studies Program at KSU and a former colleague of uh, Nick at the Battle Command Training Program. Uh, this is for Nick, and I would uh, really like all three to weigh in on it. 
um, is uh, how much uh, do you attribute uh, to Persianism, I can coin a term, and how much to Islamism as the motivators of uh, Iran's strategic actions. And uh, since this is, uh, to a great extent, an Islamic area of the world, uh, I would like the other two to weigh in on how much Islamism uh, through those uh, Central Asian countries uh, impacts uh, what we look at going forward. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Washington. Uh, it's very nice to see you again. Uh, basically, uh, what we are talking about here is about in a strategic level. It's not about uh, um, Islamism versus the secularism or anything that is of Persianism. Basically, what it is that uh, or the or geog geog or political and uh, geographical area of the European is so important that it has a, you know, open open borders with everyone. I mean, with Afghanistan, with Central Asia, with Caucasus, with Iraq, and then you know, everyone else in the in between. So basically, you know, at the same time, you know, the, you know, beside the geographical uh, ge geographical importance, the uh, uh, the Persian culture, the extension of the Persian culture that covers um, Central Asia and Caucasus, and then you know, Afghanistan, Pakistan, even part of the India. And, uh, and of course, in Iran and other places. So that uh, uh, soft power that uh, uh, Iran has, it become much more handy if uh, Iran become part of the uh, Western alliance, because because in the in the current situation, uh, the uh, Iran is contained by West and then others uh, because of the many uh, many different issues that we we have with the Iran and so forth. So on. But if those uh, problems solve in the process. I believe that the uh, uh, Iran can become a uh, very good uh, partner with, uh, with the West, and uh, through that, we, uh, the West can expand its influence all over the Central Asia, Caucasus, and then so forth. So, so that's a, that you know, basically depends on the uh, geography and the culture. But I do not believe that the religion makes a big difference, especially when the Iran is a sheer state, and then the rest of the Central Asia is a uh, uh, Sunni. And then at the same time, uh, the four of them are uh, Turkic-speaking population, and Tajikistan is the uh, Farsi-speaking. So you know, those, and at the same time, if you look at the uh, 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 Caucasus, uh, so, uh, uh, in the Caucasus, Azerbaijan is a kind of the mixed, mixed Turkish or Persian language. They call Azerbaijan, but it's basically it's a uh, mixture of the Farsi and uh, Turkic words. And Armenia and Georgia. And then basically, even in Armenia and Georgia, the Iranian culture is, is very deeply rooted. Uh, that that the relations between Georgians and Armenians uh, going for the last 3,000 3, years. So that, uh, in that respect, I can tell you that, uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, Persian culture that influenced the whole region is not really all of the time, all the time is religious. And at the same time, it has secular uh, of, uh, view that basically influenced the Christian Georgians and Christian Armenians as well. Thank you. I, just on the, on, on the development of SCO, et cetera, I mean, obviously I focus primarily on the economic questions and less the political strategic side. Um, but as a focal point for coordination uh, for the SCO and for the future of it, I do think, and if we look at the I mean, historical development of the organization, um, the, the question of the threat of extremism, of Islamic extremism, plays a very large role um, in the narrative of the development of the SCO. Um, and while it obviously hasn't been seen as salient, especially in Xinjiang recently, the fact that we saw the 2009 riots in the north in urbanized Urumqi, not in the south, not in Hotan, not in Kashgar, um, we've seen elements of, of issues there. But the fact that the main serious security threat was in an urban setting, in a, in a city that is much, much, much more secular, um, does to some degree uh, minimize, or at least uh, has, has, has moved away from the core the question of Islamism. Uh, uh, of Islamism. However, I doubt uh, that uh, that will change the fact that it will remain an important focal point, and that where there might be other conflicts on economics or whatever, um, Islamism will still play a role in, I think, binding the entity together, at least with some sort of clear common mission and purpose. Maybe I can chime in on this question, too, because I do research on Islamization of Islam. 
<laughs> okay, so I do research on instrumentalization of Islam in Central Asia, and uh, instrumentalization says it all. So the impact of Islam on Central Asian states' policies is going to vary dependent on um, the political goals pursued by individual governments and regimes in that region. So instrumentalization means using Islam, Islamic ideology, Islamic themes, uh, how it suits political interests of those in power. So when it suits their political interests, they will use Islamic rhetoric to promote cooperation. And it only, uh, I would say that only um, relates to um, economic cooperation with Islamic states, particularly by Kazakhstan. So Kazakhstan has tried to lay in roots into the organization of Islamic states and present itself as a leader in Islamic financial banking. So this Islamic rhetoric and, create, and kind of talking about some sort of common Islamic identity is used more as a way of attracting finances from other Islamic nations. But on the other hand, um, all Central Asian governments make sure to present their Islam as local, as different from Islam in Arab states, in Iran, in, um, in, in other Middle Eastern countries. Um, that um, notion of Islam is used as a way of creating this national unifying ideology of a, for example, greater Kazakh nation or greater respect nation. So in this way, Islam is actually a dividing factor. And in Kyrgyzstan, Islam is, um, has been shown to not constitute kind of an overarching identity for all, Kyrgy all Kyrgyz, where sub-national and sub-ethnic identity and, and identifications continue to play a much stronger role. I'm definitely not an expert on this subject, but I'll just make a couple of points. First of all, I, I agree with what Brad said about the importance of the threat of radical Islam as a, as a factor in, in strengthening the SEO. And, uh, you know, if you look at uh, the situation I talked about in Kyrgyzstan, it did not really have a, an element of uh, radical Islamism to it. Uh, so that's possibly another reason that uh, the, uh, the SEO really didn't contemplate intervention. But I think that uh, as in next year when U.S. forces withdraw from Afghanistan, uh, this concern will really come to the fore because there's a chance that, uh, uh, that Afghanistan could further destabilize and it could have regional spillover effects. So uh, there's been a lot of development of the SEO recently that hasn't had a lot to do with Islam, but we could see the issue come back to the fore pretty soon. Yeah. Just, yeah. Um, Okay, first of all, thanks uh, to the panel. This is a, a fascinating discussion. Um, very sort of uh, crystal ball type questioning. Um, when we look at the organizations, and I appreciate treating these organizations, organizations in a serious way as opposed to sort of, you know, you said these, these paper tigers. Um, have you noticed uh, funding trends of the member states with these organizations? That is, are they putting more money into the SEO than they would with another membership? I mean, all of the countries involved belong to multiple organizations. I mean, this is the sort of classic European phenomenon of, you know, overlapping security architecture, and you can broaden that to security and economic architecture. And so, you know, countries make choices. You know, who's putting money into which organization and not? What do they emphasize? Have you seen different trends over years on funding? Um, and have you seen, and this is now the crystal ball moment, when you look forward, do you see expansion taking place in terms of membership? There's a lot of talk about it. We obviously have the observer members, partner members, and all this, but do you see development taking place and what direction might that be? Um, and then lastly, uh, again, looking forward, um, efforts of these organizations to look uh, to partner with other structures, existing ones, uh, European Union, OSCE, SARC, you, know, you name it. Um, are they looking at complementing other international, regional, or regional organizations or are they looking at really going on their own? And this really is for all of you, because among these organizations, I should stress uh, the Economic Cooperation Organization, which includes Iran. Uh, doesn't include Russia, China, but obviously the Central Asian states. And so all of your thoughts on this, please. <laughs> yeah. Lost left there, lost there, yeah. thank you. Um, well, let me kind of work, let me, let me work backward. Um, with regard to the question of partnerships broadly, um, we do see, especially with the Eurasian Union, um, a very clear and explicit goal of uh, the, the, the usual stuff about the new Silk Road um, and a question of supporting further economic integration with Europe. Um, and there have been explicit measures begun um, to basically facilitate uh, trade clearance, customs, etc., um, that will ultimately result in requiring a more uh, stronger, uh, stronger role 
Um, the Eurasian Economic Community also has a, has observer status at a very large number of global institutions. I mean, the United Nations and so on and so forth. It is able to participate in meetings. It goes to multilateral development bank meetings. Um, it is it has been uh, the Russian government has been very focused on raising its profile um, as much as possible. Um, so, and also even attending SCO meetings. Um, with regard to the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, I'm less uh, I'm less certain. I think that the development of the of the SCO Development Bank is likely to have a significant impact as regards the SCO's interaction with uh, multilateral development institutions. Um, CARAC, the ADB initiative, the World Bank, obviously are already doing such a huge amount in the region that it would be very hard uh, for either of the two main entities in the region not to interact with them. And we are seeing closer ties, also significant crossover in staff. Um, there are people who've gone from the Eurasian Development Bank to the Asian Development Bank and so on and so forth. So there is that internal relationship as well. Um, on the question of membership expansion for the issue of the Eurasian organization, um, Kyrgyzstan followed by, by Tajikistan um, is, uh, is coming uh, for towards the customs union. I, I think that there's a the preponderance of evidence indicates that that is likely to be the case. I'm not going to weigh in. I'm going to leave it to people much more expert than I <laughs> on the question of, um, of the SCO and membership expansion. It's obviously been quite uh, quite contentious. One last comment on the question of funding trends. Um, this has been a shift, um, and we have seen Russia increasingly uh, willing to put in funds where previously it hadn't, partially to some degree. This is simply because China has been so, so generous, uh, to use a word, <laughs> on, on, how, on, on what it supported. Um, at the same time, um, we are seeing uh, the rise of, of SEO Development Bank, etc. This is fundamentally going to be uh, heavily Chinese funded, it's, uh, and China is pushing for this and projects that will be based on integrating Xinjiang and the Far West with Central Asia. And they have increasingly, not just as part of the 2000-2001 Jiangsu Vineyard uh, Great Western Development Plan, um, but this has been a year-on-year -year increase since then in terms of uh, China actually putting its money where its mouth is for economic integration with Central Asia. I remember back in 2005, I went to a presentation by a PhD student who focused on Central Asia, and uh, he was asked about the events in Kyrgyzstan at that time, and he said, well, I just don't think there's going to be any kind of revolution. I just don't see that happening. And the very next day, the Akaya regime fell. So uh, I'm really leery of making predictions. <laughs> but my general feeling is that, uh, that Expansion of SCO membership would be really difficult. Uh, at this point, it's still fairly weakly institutionalized, and to expand it would, would risk further diluting it. Um, I suppose it's possible at some point, if, if Russia feels that China is beginning to really dominate the organization, that they might try to bring in India or, or other members to try to provide some balance. But uh, I think that remains a ways off. Um, and you know, Russia would probably, in terms of security matters, Russia would probably prefer to to use the Collective Security Treaty Organization, but that didn't really prove effective in, in uh, the last case that I discussed. And, uh, and as, as China's power and influence in the region grows, I don't think Russia is really going to be able to ignore China's interests. So I I think that Russia is maybe in a bit of a bind because they'll have to look more to the SCO, but uh, they may feel that they're losing out more and more to China. Well, I believe that the SCO can expand or based on the or based on the international situation. How the or forces or forces on in, uh, international transport are um, competing with each other, especially in Eurasia. Basically, what will happen in Iran and then the other parts of the Central Asia will affect the membership of the CSO. And, uh, Uh, membership of uh, SCO. Uh, for now, for now everything is hunky dory. Okay, everything is hunky dory. But in the future, based on the needs of the Russia and China, maybe they change the membership, and then who must be there? For example, right now, uh, they are uh, the China try to block uh, Iranian um, membership uh, in uh, SCO in order to do not create more problem with the uh, United States and other. Other Western countries. Even they put the uh, they put the uh, in 2010. They declared that the whoever has pro who, any country 
who has problem with the United Nations and other international organizations uh, must first solve that problem. Then after that can be a part of the SCO. But, but in reality, it depends on the... In reality, it depends on, again, uh, the uh, situation on the ground. But, uh, the, but for example, the uh, Eurasian uh, Custom Union, that we just see that uh, uh, they are talking about the last you know, four or five months or a little bit more, we see that there is a uh, serious problem. Uh, for example, um, uh, because I'm following with the Armenians news and everything else, for example, I see that the Armenians resisting to be part of the uh, uh, Eurasia uh, uh, custom union. And then the Russians are pressuring to do that, but uh, they are resisting because they, uh, because they say that uh, because they say that we do not have a border with uh, uh, Russia and therefore it's useless for us. So it depends on how you, how uh, how the uh, games are going on, economic and the geopolitical issues that the Russia and China face in the, uh, in the region. That would that would uh, help to uh, kind of to see the future. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna take. Thank you. I join Roger and thank you all for your, your excellent uh, presentations. I'm Tom Wilhelm, Director of the Foreign Military Studies Office. Uh, my question is for Brian. Um, uh, especially as we went through your, your case studies on the, the crisis, in particular the last one uh, with Kyrgyzstan bordering uh, China's rest of the West, is there an instance, a case, a speculation you could make on, on whether China and, and under what conditions and how it might uh, project actual military force outside of its borders. It seems to me that it's at the, uh, an unspoken part of, of calculation in academe and in policy, not just in the United States, but other places. Yet I don't really see where there, there's, where there are you know, uh, you know, threads or uh, vectors that, that point to the, this actually <coughs> happening. So if you could comment on that. Yeah, that's it. A good question, and I, I agree with your point. I, I think there's there aren't many examples of that. Uh, China has been increasingly a participant in UN peacekeeping missions around the world. In fact, uh, one of, I think maybe it's, it's the major, the largest co contributor in terms of numbers of troops. But of course, that that's always under UN auspices and always for pur for, for purposes of, of peacekeeping. So that uh, would have been a little bit different from the situation in Kyrgyzstan. Uh, you know, I think one of the major goals of China with the SCO and, and in general in its relations with Central Asia has been to prevent any support coming from Central Asia uh, for separatist movements in Xinjiang. And uh, I think they've been largely successful in that. Uh, I suppose you know, there's some kind of scenario you could think of in which uh, Xinjiang really started to destabilize and you had support coming from the Central Asian region, and uh, China might feel the need to intervene, but that's, that doesn't seem like a, a real likely scenario for the foreseeable future. Uh, you know, I mentioned the, the writing by uh, Zhao Huasheng, and, and he was arguing that uh, China has, has, in these types of situations, adhered to a doctrine of, of non-interference in the domestic politics of other countries. And I, I think that is their, their basic approach. And, but he's just saying that, uh, that that they could continue to pursue that approach, but also form a doctrine of uh, intervening to restore stability. Uh, and and he, he's saying that you could imagine scenarios in which uh, order would break down in Central Asia, and intervention by China would be necessary to to uh, not only uh, restore order, but also for China to protect its own interests in the region, which are growing. But he says, you know, these are very preliminary ideas. They're a long way from being uh, from being uh, seriously considered, I think, by the, the government. I, I think that for a long time, China's basic approach to international security has been to uh, nurture an, an amicable international environment. Uh, their power grows. But I think if you see that, it's likely to directed uh, first toward those regions. Uh, I, I think that, uh, that possible intervention in the Central Asian region would be a, a more distant and more unlikely scenario. 
Alex Tsiok, Center for Russian East European Studies, KU here. Uh, based on the previous discussion, I would invite the panelists to make safe predictions for the 21st century of the evolution of two terms that are used all the time. One is noun security, and the other is an adjective strategic. Traditionally, and I will explain what I mean, strategic implied joint position and joint action. What we see in this new formation is the tendency to use it selectively or to have really semi-strategic relations. And security, the new component and the new meaning and what it involves. Again, it can be used selectively and imply different things for different countries or strategic partners. If you would be willing to comment on that and your predictions are safe. This is where I get to claim being a political economist. <laughs> This is where I'd like to sit down for an hour and think about it and then, and then try to write a response. Um, that's tough. I think that it, you know, if you look uh, primarily at, at the Central Asian region, uh, it's, it's the, the, the main, there are a few different elements of security. And I think uh, the number one overriding factor in security for, for the member countries, which we've already discussed, is uh, you know, maintaining order and, and combating um, the three evils, terrorism, extremism, and, and separatism. And uh, uh, so I, I think that, uh, that radical Islam and the terrorist threat, although it seems to have subsided a little bit uh, recently, uh, could come to the fore again, as I mentioned. Afghanistan, and this this does seem to be a glue that can kind of hold these countries together, and could potentially also um, allow for some cooperation with the West and, and other organizations. Of course, after 9/11, uh, Russia and China were willing to uh, to support uh, the United States establishing uh, bases in the regions to su to support operations in Afghanistan, and so there is a, a precedent for that kind of cooperation. Um, in terms of Bigger picture security, uh, of course, the, you know, China, I think, is primarily focused on uh, East Asia and Southeast Asia. Uh, Russia has less of a, a stake there, I think. Uh, when Xi Jinping made his first state visit to, uh, to Russia, a lot of news accounts interpreted that as, as China trying to, to respond to the U.S. pivot uh, to Asia. Uh, I, I'm a little bit skeptical of that. I, I think that uh, China, of course, wants to maintain good relations with Russia so that they just don't have to worry about that front and they can focus on, on other issues. But I, I just don't see the formation of any kind of uh, China-Russia uh, alliance against the West or serious partnership to, to combat the West or even to counteract the pivot. Uh, and let's see, so I guess I've tried to kind of address security uh, in terms of strategy. Well, Russia and China have a, a strategic partnership. Uh, after many years, uh, still not sure exactly what that means. Uh, it, as I said, I, I don't think it's it's not an alliance. It's not likely to ever become that. It's it's sort of a, a means by which uh, both countries can can uh, gain some benefits uh, from that relationship. Uh, for China, uh, stability on, on, on its northern border, energy arms sales, especially in the past. Uh, for Russia, at times, they can kind of use China as leverage against the West. Uh, in the UN Security Council, oftentimes, Russia sort of takes the lead in criticizing US positions, and China is willing to let them do that. But I think, as far as I can tell, that's sort of the extent of the, of the strategic uh, partnership. And as I said, I think there are limits on how far that partnership can go. So I don't know if that really addressed the question, but. Off the cup, that's my best try. <laughs> in my opinion, that uh, uh, in the current situation, um, basically uh, all those um, main uh, global powers, they are trying to keep the status quo. But the only uh, only problem in here that may uh, uh, become a destabilizing factor 
and the may change the uh, geopolitical issues in the um, Eurasia is a new war in the Middle East. If not, if any new war, especially with Iran, happen, definitely it will change the whole uh, spectrum of the issues in the uh, uh, Central Asia and the Caucasus and the rest of the rest of the Eurasia. Uh, I believe that would be the uh, most important factor in that respect. And uh, of course, if Afghanistan become a, a more unstable, that creates more problem. But but basically, uh, basically for current situation, uh, everyone is happy with the status quo. That's what I but that's what I see. Thank you. Um, the question again, this is where I put what on this. So. <laughs> On the question of security, I think we can look at it from the Russian perspective as, uh, at least or for the interests of Russia, as being, uh, it has to be a broader term. Um, and I think the questions that we need to bring in are questions of demography and questions of economics. Um, the concept that keeps coming up in terms of both Russia's view of integration with China and this view in Central Asia is the sheer size of the People's Republic of China, 1.3 billion people. We're all familiar with the work on the population trends in Russia. I mean, even though the one-child policy has stabilized China at 1.3 billion, this is a very significant difference in population. Um, and for Russia and the Central Asian states, bringing in and recognizing fundamentally that demographic difference, I think, is going to remain and continue to be essential. At the same time, we have a similar gap in the size of the economies. Um, we are looking at a fear, a very serious fear on the part of Russia, of basically being a resource appendage to, to China um, and really losing a significant amount of its uh, of, of, of any influence it would have on the relationship year by year as the Chinese economy becomes larger and Russia continues to basically be a resource, uh, resource exporting economy. So for security questions, I would say in this relationship, expanding on those uh, demographic and economic factors will remain quite salient. Um, on strategic questions, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to punt on this one. <laughs> um, um, and uh, I don't think I can do uh, any better than uh, the response given by my fellow panelists. So <laughs> there we are. John Kennedy, and my question is uh, basically when you talk about the, the SCO and the relationships between Central Asia and Russia and China, how my, my question is how would the bilateral relationships between China and Central Asia and Russia and Russia and Central Asian countries, uh, do these bilateral relationships strengthen, weaken, or neutral when it comes to the SOE, uh, I mean the SC, the <laughs> I'm acronym, uh, acronym petition. Um, <laughs> The SEO relations and the uh, international uh, international it's for everybody. Well, if, if, uh, well a, few, a, a few areas that I I found most interesting. I think that um, and I mentioned very briefly towards the end of the presentation. Um, the question of Chinese Uzbek relations, I think, are particularly salient here. Um, Uzbekistan has fundamentally said, all right, we're not a big fan of this Eurasia project. We're not supporting this integration. Historically, Uzbekistan is significantly less economically integrated with Russia, less dependent upon Russia than the other countries of the region. Um, and looking at the development of the China-Uzbek relationship, uh, which has gotten significantly better, significantly closer, um, is, I think, a marker uh, to some degree as to, as to how things might play out in the SCO. I think it is a canary in the, canary in the mine shaft, uh, lack of a better phrase. Um, the Russia-Kazakh relationship and Kazakhstan's bilateral relationship with both countries, I still see as, as, the, as the, core, uh, the core relationship in the region, the, the area that can tell us the absolute most about where things are developing. Um, years ago, if you talked about Kazakhstan, everybody would have told you, oh, Kazakhstan's ambassador in Beijing, he's so fluent Mandarin, look at the deal with uh, Kazakh oil. Uh, Kazakhstan's been wonderfully helpful with regard to uh, the Uyghur insurgent issue um, and preventing support crossing the border uh, from Almaty. Um, and today, though, we're seeing quite a shift. We've seen a shift where Kazakhstan has very much uh, moved very much closer, in my view, uh, towards Russia, towards supporting Russian interests as part of the customs union. Um, obviously, there's a, a significant number of other bilateral uh, relationships that we can look at. But for me, those two, I think, are the, are the most intriguing. Uh, I agree about the importance of uh, Kazakhstan in this equation. I actually think that uh, the Central Asian countries, in some cases, have have done a pretty good job of playing China and Russia off against each other to sort of maximize their own interests, and, and Kazakhstan is a textbook case of that. Um, you know, they've uh, built a, a oil pipeline to China, a gas pipeline that goes through their territory, uh, welcomed Chinese investment, and it's really provided a 
counterbalance to Russia, which has enabled them to, I think, to deal with Russia on a, a stronger footing. So it's uh, uh, you know, something that uh, the countries in the region can use to their benefit. The question. You answer my question. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, there's a question here somewhere at the front line. Yes, uh, Gary Bjorgi from the uh, Command Gen Army Command General Staff College. Um, my, my question uh, uh, revolves around the uh, issue of, uh, I guess you mentioned elite uh, economic interests uh, versus uh, maybe national interests. And uh, I think with uh, you know the Russian uh, case, we have uh, Putin and his uh, political party were called the uh, uh, party of uh, crooks and thieves by the uh, opposition. And we know that uh, you know China has the uh, uh, red nobility class with uh, billionaires, um, you know, kind of making their fortunes with uh, some shady business dealings and uh, using, uh, I guess you could say, muscle to uh, make sure they have uh, you know, continued control of the country. Um, what I was uh, wondering about here is that uh, when you see these organizations being created and the uh, economic decisions being made, how do you, uh, in your own assessment, judge the uh, role of elite economic interests versus, let's say, national interests of the people? I think with the Cypriot uh, banking crisis that we just saw, in a sense, the Russian government was kind of protecting the uh, interests of the money launderers, or you might say uh, mafia money that was uh, being stashed in uh, Cyprus. Um, and uh, you know, we kind of see that around, around the world, elites making money, uh, and are they really considering national interest? So I, my first question then would be, uh, do you have a sense of how much these uh, economic developments you described are elite economic uh, based on elite economic interests uh, versus uh, national interests. And then I guess what would be national interests? And then the second question kind of follows on this, and, and you had made a comment uh, regarding this just now, about um, you really feel that uh, this latest Russian shift in policy towards uh, uh, closer economic association or uh, integration with China is really in the uh, long-term interest of the uh, Russian people. Um, I'll start with the second, the second part first. Um, I think the the what Medvedev has, has pushed for and supported during the last SCO meeting with regard to the Shanghai Cooperation Organization Development Bank and essential uh, develop mostly technical assistance type projects, technical assistance loans. Um, he has still blocked and has basically not spoken in any way more positive about trade integration at this stage. Um, I think that what, now that the customs union is in effect and it does seem to be progressing with a reasonable level of institutionalization, that uh, the support for the SDO Development Bank is a, is a positive thing. Um, the Eurasian Development Bank was, it is uh, limited. Um, so in that area, yes, I think that it's, that it's beneficial and it will, particularly for the countries of Central Asia, have a significant benefit in terms of expanding on uh, development programming, and, and et cetera. Um, in terms of the, lo the long-term interests of, of the Russian state and the actual Russian population, um, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a question at this stage um, as to whether or not this, is, this integration with China would likely be positive. One thing that we do know from uh, Gary Hamilton's work um, on uh, the development uh, historically of the Taiwanese and, and, and Korean economies um, is obviously the vital importance of global integration and being tied to a regional economic power. Um, in order to, and Russia has pushed that. It's basically said, yeah, we do have to recognize the role of China and, and the engine that China can provide to the Russian economy. Um, and also, as Russia as, uh, Russia has not had a, uh, has a, it has increasingly positive uh, economic relations with Europe. Um, but for the large part of Russia that isn't European, um, I don't see a way that that region can develop without some sort of practical economic relationship um, with uh, with China. Um, and going all the way to Vladivostok and. We've seen problems in the past, the Tuma Development River cooperation in the 90s, which absolutely fell apart. Um, with regard to the difference between national interest and, and state interest, I absolutely agree. We have to open up the black box and say, OK, yeah, it's not this objective, pure national interest. We have the Prince Lings in, in Beijing, and we have the Soloviki and everyone else in Moscow. 
Um, and the idea of, and I think to some degree, yes, what we're, what we're initially seeing in the earlier stages of the development of economic cooperation and integration has been a process that has primarily benefited, especially larger state-owned enterprises or firms with very significant ties to the state. What I think we're beginning to see, and which is a result of some of the reforms taking place, particularly in the Eurasian economic community, um, is a much greater focus on small and medium-sized enterprises, um, which has always been in the last 10, 15 years, Russia's great, great economic failing, um, is, the, is, is, the, is, is the focus on the large as opposed to the small. Um, and in that sense, I think that um, we can say that there have been policy, and, uh, policy changes that are, to some degree, uh, reflecting more of a national interest and not simply the narrow interests of the larger state, uh, Russian, uh, Russian resource firms, et cetera. Um, and similarly with China, um, with the same, uh, in the same way, we're not just seeing um, the big state-owned enterprises, the state-owned oil and gas firms, et cetera, uh, running the show, but a significantly large increase in small, medium-sized uh, small medium-sized firms as well as cross-border shuttle trade, um, which is now finally actually, uh, primarily actually ethnically Russian, uh, but is seeing a significant improvement. All right. Um, I'm gonna, okay. So um, time flies, doesn't it? Um, our first panel is up, um, and there is 15 minutes break.